Welcome to Inside the Nation Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Thoreau. And Tom Jones. And on this week's episode, we welcome AFL great Calvin Schechnader. Yes, Bay Area guy. And uh, what's great about our conversation with him is he has a lot of perspectives from uh, various leagues. So it's a good one. And then we, after that, we, our conversation with Calvin, we go on and we preview next week's Arena Bowl 29 matchup between the visiting Philadelphia Soul from the American Conference and the National Conference champions, Arizona Rattlers. That goes down next week at the Gila River Arena in Glendale. Glendale. So this Arizona is, bound. This is going to be a great episode. And I hope you enjoy the show. We want to welcome Calvin Schechnader uh, to Inside the Nation podcast. Hey, hey, Calvin. How you doing? Hey, hey. Thank you for having me, man. Thanks. Thanks Thank for you. Me. So I, I was, uh, I saw um, a brief little celebration party. It looks like you were partying last week down there in um, the, the, the snake pit with some of the Arizona's nice man. So how's it oh, feel yeah. to, um, to be there with back in the arena bowl? Well, it feels real good. Uh, the fact that we as an organization have been able to put out, uh, you know, a good product. Um, you know, the fans continue to support us. I mean, we have some of the best fans uh, in arena football uh, in any sport. I mean, they're loyal. They continue to come out, and uh, the coaching staff is doing a great job with putting them, putting the players in the best uh, position, and you know, giving them a chance to further their career. Because that's, you know, that's what this is all about. It's not, you know, the arena ball or arena football is not just uh, the end all, you know, it's a, you know, it's also uh, a chance for you to jump to other, other uh, leagues such as NFL. So these guys are doing a pretty good job. I mean, we'd like to see more teams more involved uh, and also former players more involved in, in, um, um, you know, the day-to-day operations or, you know, game operations and, you know, of that such. But yeah, so like, good. yeah, so like, have former players be like, like ambassadors to the league to still represent from the times that they had on field. Like for yourself, I know you're out there, you know, promoting the Arizona Rattlers because that's where you're at, and that's mm-hmm. you, you mainstay, and that's where you started your career off. So, with that said, um, how was it making um the tra- transition going from the you know the college and then going into become a Rattler in '94 and making the transition to indoor game? Well, actually, really, uh, I mean, my transition from college. Um, I played um, in the CFL, so okay. um, CFL has some similar rules, um, except they're, you know, the guys on the the guys on the line can also, you know, the guys who are stationary uh, can also move sideways, okay, yeah. whereas the guys in the slots can move forward, uh, and there were multiple guys moving forward, uh, whereas you know, arena football was basically. Uh, basically, you know, one guy moving and, you know, who can do the, you know, the looping and the moving uh, towards the line of scrimmage. So uh, I actually had some type of, um, you know, examples and it just made it easier for me. I, I mean, I tried the game and I liked it. It was fun. I enjoyed it. And, you know, the rest is history. Yes. Uh, and I, I understand uh, your I'd like to call you a Bay Area guy because the Central Valley is still part of the Bay Area, correct? That, yeah. I mean, you know, it's just, just a, a, a rock throw away. But uh, you, so you grew up in Fresno. Excuse me? I didn't hear you. Fresno? Yeah, you grew Fresno, up in Fresno, California. So yeah. uh, I, I'm sure uh, going through uh, high school and everything, you're probably looking at going to uh, play for Fresno State. Was that uh, ever in your plans? Ideally? Well, no, it didn't ruin my plans. I mean, I was recruited by Fresno State, uh, and I chose uh, – I mean, I had a situation where um, I, I had actually signed I, – not, not signed a letter of intent, but I had verbally committed to Fresno State, and I was just talking to a friend about this. Uh, and – oh, no, my, some of my coworkers are passing by, but I had signed with – I mean, I verbally gave a commitment to Fresno State, and I ended up um, going or I ended up signing with New Mexico, wow. University of New Mexico, the Lobos. Yeah, yeah. Lobos, yeah. So with that said, with that said, I, 
I was at Fresno City, so I was one credit shy, and I didn't make it to the the Lobos that 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 uh, that semester. Ah. And Washington State was after me. That's when Dennis Eric Dennis Erickson was at Washington State, and they were still after me. And they said, "We want you to come, and we want you to come to the campus." And I said, "You know, kind of, you know." Mike Shepard and you know Coach Shepard at you know New Mexico and Terrence Terrence Mathis was there and and I said you know I was kind of set on going there but he sent he sent for me and I and I actually I actually signed a letter of intent and finished uh, finished up and went to Washington State and Mike Price was the coach at the time then. So you got the warm and fuzzies. Yes, you, uh, I did. It yeah. turns out that you went there, and it, it all kind of just fell in place from there, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I really, I, I really think back at you know that situation, and I think, uh, you know, what what was the best opportunity for me, or what should I have done? I mean, I had you know my parents, my dad wanted me to stay at Fresno State. He actually wanted me to stay at Fresno State, and well, actually, my mom wanted me to stay at Fresno State, and my dad wanted me to just go wherever I wanted to go. He didn't, he didn't really, he didn't really care. Uh, he just wanted me to be successful. Yeah. Maybe you wanted to kind of get out of the, uh, central Valley a little bit and kind of see, see what other areas have to offer. So I could yeah. completely understand that. Yeah. Cause I took, I mean, some of my trips were, you know, uh, uh most of my trips were on the uh, West coast, which was Arizona University of Arizona, uh, New Mexico, uh, Washington State. Uh, I was going to take one out to Houston at the time. You know when they were they were in that that happy offense where they had five wide receivers, Manny Hazard, and, and you know they were just throwing the ball like crazy. I was going to I was going to go there. I mean, opportunity. I, I to head coach. He was man. I mean, I was fired up. My family's from Houston. My mother's side of the family was from Houston, so I was, yeah. I was really fired up. So it sounds like um, you have a little bit when you came back and you, you're hitting out your pro your pro career and you're going into um, the CFL is one thing. So you had to learn like the new spread and now going from 11 man on the field to 12 man and uh, the high emotion guy and the, yeah. and even a, a bigger field. Uh, so yeah. how the how the training and getting your body in shape for even a bigger field to be a little bit more able to last longer on that field out there in Canada? Well, I mean more so than anything. I think you just got to get used to the rules because they were so different. I mean, when he said that you can move along the, you know, you can move along the line of scrimmage and multiple people are in motion for Canada, that's a little bit different. I mean, you got a lot of moving parts, whereas in arena football, you have one moving part uh, and, you know, you're just making reads on the run. It's basically how I, you know, how I look at it. I mean, it's, it's a, uh, you know, it's totally, totally different from the size of the field as well as the rules of the game. You know, the three downs that you get in Canada football, you know, Canadian football, um, you know, that. And, 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 and then also you have to deal with the weather. Yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. I can imagine. <laughs> yeah. The weather is totally different. And then, you know, so I, I had a chance to go from there to uh, – a team that was down here, which was the Sacramento Gold Miners, which, hey, you, you know, you're playing inside the states in the Canadian Football League. Hey, you know, you can't beat that. Yeah. At the, but when arena football was introduced to me and uh, I talked to Danny White um, and uh, one of my coaches at Fresno City was Coach Bowling uh, uh, at the time. Uh, introduced me to Pete Catella. Pete Catella is, introduced me to... Uh, Coach White, and you know, I talked with Coach White, and he said, uh, yeah, "This is a good opportunity. We want you to come down here. We've seen what you can do on the field. Uh, we want you to, you know, be our offensive specialist." So I said, "Hey, you know, here's the opportunity. I'm gonna take it. I'm not gonna shun, you know, shun arena football and say, well, you know, it's this type of league. I'm gonna take every opportunity and make it, make it the best, you know, best situation for myself." And you, and you had a standard uh, there in Arizona, or they had a yeah. standard in Arizona. So how would that standard compare, or can you even compare that to the CFL 
was just a different attitude or is it because I know in Arizona they're looking to to win I'm sure in, in the CFL it's the same right well I would say it's the same I, and, you know I'm not gonna you know you Edmonton was just as um you know important uh important winning as it was in Arizona. And I think that every organization has that. I mean, they, you know, but Edmonton was one of the teams that were on top. You know, they were at the pinnacle of, of, of CFIO football when I was there. And Arizona was just coming into it. I mean, they had been in, been in the leagues 92, 93, and I came over here in 94. And then we won the Arena Bowl my, you know, my, uh, my rookie year. So, I mean, we set Danny. Danny set high expectations. Yeah. For for pro football, it doesn't matter where you are. Right. He set high expectations. So. Yeah, you know, he's, he's got the um, that the cowboy blood in him. So he that's yeah. why he tries to relay on on to him. And when you came into the league and played for the Rattlers, how was it to have um, Cedric Bonner as your QB? Excuse me. Say it again. How was it uh, to have Cedric Bonner as your QB? Cedric Bonner is a professional, you know, uh, um, I come to know him as a great friend and, you know, someone who I can, you know, talk to as a brother. Um, you know, he was one of those guys who, who can talk to you and push you to do things that you needed to do, uh, you know, by his, by his examples, you know, so was Hunky Cooper. Uh, you know, he was, he was one of those, uh, you know, guys who, um, you know, he was more of the fire, you know, said was more, you know, um, the political, you know, let's get it done. You know what we need to do. And, you know, I, I followed those examples, uh, coach white being instrumental and, um, you know, even also, uh, Jerry Quangelo, I haven't got a chance to talk to him my rookie year, um, you know, working out and, you know, he just he just talked about being professional, and and really it was the whole the whole organization from Coangelo on down, which uh, when they uh, owned the team, were about being professional. Yeah, and that's what it you know that's what it came down to. We won a lot of awards, other than just football. It was about just being a professional and understanding your role as uh, a player on and off the field. So. Uh... So that's that's interesting that you uh, mentioned that, and uh, you know I, I see that you have it. Uh, you had it in Arizona, you had it in the CFL. Um, what was mm-hmm. the biggest transition that you had, or the biggest challenge that you had transitioning from the outside game to the uh, indoor with everything you know, uh, you know, half the size? Man, it, it it would have to be it would have to be like you said, the size of the field. That was the biggest transition because everything was so quick. Everything was just right in your face. I mean, you know, adjustment of routes is totally different. When you think you have time in in arena uh, compared to the outside field, that's totally different. I mean, like you said, those walls have <laughs> never lost a match. Yeah, they have never lost a match since I. I mean, since I came in there, that was you know that was already intimidating. The very fact that. You know, you have to run different type routes. You have to be quicker. You have to understand where you are on the field at all points and times. If you don't, you can find yourself over that wall in, you know, in somebody's lap eating popcorn. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so that's maybe that's the real reason why they go over the wall because they want to get a little snack or something, you know. <laughs> hey, a couple of times I have. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> and, and uh, you know, I, I know that the uh, – when the refs see you go over the wall, yeah, uh, you know now, now today, as long as you're hanging onto the ball. So uh, let's be honest here. Uh, was there a couple of times maybe where you weren't fully in uh, contact with the ball and in charge of the ball, but when the referee got there, you were holding it like you'd been holding it all the time. Of course. <laughs> hey, hey, of course. I mean, hey, I mean, you know, there were there were different, you know. Sometimes, you know, you 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 hit the wall and the ball, you know, simultaneously you leave, you know, you have your hands underneath, but you are, you know, you're trying to make a catch. 
and some of the rules were a little bit different when it came to that. So um, they've changed they've changed the rules a little bit, but. I mean, you're trying to compete, so you're definitely going to, you know, try to get the best advantage that you possibly can. Absolutely. That's good. And how uh, We know that you spent like around four years with Arizona, and then you had a couple years off, and one when you came with the San Francisco Demons and the XFL. Um, but how is your transition now? You're coming back, and you're coming back from being off the AFL season for a couple years to join the Sabercats in 2004 with their uh, second franchise Arena Bowl season. Yeah, well, I... Uh, I spent 94 through 99, and that's when I went to the San Diego Chargers. Okay. Uh, I had, I had, you know, Bobby Beathard, uh, which was that, that was his last year there, I guess, or, you know, GM. And, you know, he gave me an opportunity, man. He, he you know, he, and, and I, you know, and I really like his concept and his, you know, his, uh, his way of thinking, you know, he's always been the type of person that, you know, have given people, you know, no matter what their background was and where, you know, where they came from, what college they came from, small or big school, he believed in the person. Yeah. And I think a lot of people, a lot of GMs need to look at that, look at the heart of an individual, look at the, you know, look at the body of work that they're trying to do or that individual, that person. And then draw a conclusion. But he gave me that opportunity. And then, you know, I stayed there for that year. And then I moved on to uh, to the San Francisco Demons. That was interesting. I thought. <laughs> <laughs> was that like WWF for uh, football? Is, is that what yeah. it felt like, the players? Yeah, that, that, you know, it was it was a little different in the sense that they would ask me, uh <laughs> They, I think one time, and this is this. I mean, it's kind of funny, but they asked me to create some controversy. You know? <laughs> it was like, uh, it, it, you know, it's like, uh, how would you say, um, uh, show business? Uh, I'm, trying to, or, uh... I'm trying to think of the word that that, that he, it, it, you know, but it was controversy. He was like, you know, we need to get you, uh, uh, you know, some some. I wouldn't say scandalous. It wasn't like it's like you know, like yeah, don't you know, like you and a cheerleader. And I was like, no, uh, thanks. Yeah, instigate. Yeah, a, a storyline there <laughs> yeah. for ratings. So yeah, um, wanted, you go, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, we're going to transition now into when you joined the, the Saber Cats in, in 2004. So how was it to rejoin? Because I know. You're one year with the, the San Francisco Demons. You played with a guy named James Hunden. So now you're coming back with the Sabercats, and you rejoin him. So how was it working with him? It was fun. I, I, I'm not going to lie. I mean, I, I had a chance to go to the uh, to the San Diego – I mean, not San Diego. Go to the San Jose team a while before that, even before that, um, before I uh, signed another contract with Arizona. And I had met uh, John Fry down there in uh, – and the Fry Corporation, and I mean, a lot of people were telling me to come there. I mean, so when so when I got the opportunity, and I I want to say I was I was released by Arizona. Uh, I was I was released by Arizona, and I said, you know what, I'm going to retire. I'm basically going to you know just retire for a year. You know, and see, see, you know, see what comes about, or just period. I'm done with football, and I got a call from um, um, from San Jose saying we need you, and I said, um, you know, I haven't really been working out that much. <laughs> we, you know, we need you. We need you to come out and do what you can. And I actually. You know, I came in, I think the first game, I only scored two or three touchdowns, and I really wasn't working out. I mean, it was like, I was like, you know, if I had been in shape, in some kind of real good shape, then I'd be like, man, that would have been, a, that would have been really interesting to be in shape. I had to get in shape for, for the first couple of weeks, but it was, I mean, I really liked it. I really enjoyed the players. Some of the, you know, it was a lot of players that I knew and played, you know, that played against. It was fun. So was it was it kind of similar uh, play structuring and just the whole offense? Was was there a learning curve going from uh, 
San Jose, or from uh, Arizona, San Jose? Yes, there was. Because Coach Malley was a type of player. I mean, he was a type of coach. I mean, he was all about he was all about perfection. I mean, he would he would get on you. He would get on you uh, for the littlest of things. You know, he was. You need to do it this way. You need to be about being direct, and I mean, he would he would drill you, and he didn't care. He didn't care who. He didn't care who he was talking to. If you were doing something wrong, you got it. Oh yeah, yeah. So how was it um, to join the the, the Sabre Cat organization? Just like two years prior, when they won their um, first franchise arena bowl against the Arizona Rattlers, and then they go and play them again in Arizona for their second one from a team that you used to play with. Uh. <laughs> uh, yeah, and that and that was and that was one of the biggest things because Arizona was such. Arizona had, you know. Look at it like this. When I played with Arizona, we never lost to we never lost to San Jose. When I played with San Jose, we never lost to Arizona. Ah, uh, it sounds like uh, there's somebody. Uh, there's, there's a relationship. Yeah, that some, on some a guy by the name of Calvin was the uh, missing ingredient no, I, for both teams. Now, that, no, I'm coming coming into that. Yeah, you could say for the for the early part of the season that was true. When you know when we played against San Jose, that was a game. Yeah, and we never lost to San Jose. Yeah, I mean, at, at least at least the times that I played. Now, if I was injured or something like that, that was different. But the times I played, and I played against them a number of times, we never lost to them. So when they came, you know, and they made we you know we had going back some you know going back and forth with players and all that. And, you know, we like to acknowledge our accomplishments and you know say one to another that. Hey, we, I did this, or I was successful. So you know, good. The good part of it is that I was on a good organization who wanted me to be out there, who accepted me and gave me another opportunity to to go out there and play for another three years. And I enjoyed those last three years that I played with Arena Football, and you know, um, it was fun. I I wish we could have won, you know, more, but. I mean, there was a lot of parody. There's a lot of parody uh, in our era. I mean, we had you. you know, it was fierce competition. It's not just you know a gimme game. Um, you had to you, you know you had to bring it. Yeah, it was uh, it was taken personal. Yeah, this it was rivalry. Taken per- yeah, this, this rivalry was taken personal. I I mean, I came back and fans were not as you know <laughs> you know. Cordial. Let me say that cordial. As, you know, when I, when I when I stepped on the field the first time against them back there, um, and we won. I mean, it's like, hey, this is serious. I mean, I can understand. You would think that they would give some type of love. Nah. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> <laughs> no. So, so with lo- that, loyalty wasn't uh, playing no. a factor here. Yeah, with that, uh, bring up the fans. So how how was your in, in time with your time stint in Arizona? How was your fan relationship with the Arizona's Nightman? And then when you transitioned to San Jose with San Jose's Nightman, how was your relationship with the two fan groups? I you know what, I believe I was okay with you know both both fan groups. I mean, I've I've grown to have you know to have close relationships with a lot of different fans. Whether I was in Arizona. Whether I was in Tampa, because I did play in Tampa, uh, Tampa uh, for uh, one year, and then I played with San Jose. So I want to say that fans enjoyed me, and I enjoyed them. The relationship with uh, fans in arena football is unique in the sense that they are right there in your face. Uh, sometimes you're sitting, you're sitting there, you know, you know, waiting for a play, and you can be talking to a fan. Yeah, yeah. we've done that once or twice yeah. in San Jose. I would talk with yeah. you while you're on the line. Yeah, they talk, you know, talking while you know they'll they'll talk. Or if you're just waiting and it's halftime, or you know, or if it's a, you know, TV timeout, you know, you can sit there and talk to them. And hey, you know, hey, shakes, how you doing, shakes? You know, looking good. Yeah, thanks, man. You know, you plan on doing? You know, how many touchdowns you gonna get? Now, hey, man, I don't know. <laughs> do the best we can. You know. You want some of this popcorn? <laughs> yeah. <man. laughs> 
And, you know, depending on where you went, depending on what, you know, environment you were at, you know, I, I remember Orlando being one of the fiercest places, places to play when I first started. I mean, the jungle was nothing, <laughs> nothing kind. They yeah. love their football in Florida. They love their football in Florida. That, you know, and we played that arena football game down there in 94, and Zendaya House got hit in the head with a, with a quarter. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was fierce, man. It was, it was fierce. So now, uh, how about your family uh, as far as, you know, going to the games? And uh, was it a little easier for them to, uh, you know, go to the Sabercats being, you know, part of the Bay Area? Yeah. Yes, being I mean being in California, you know them, you know them being in California, and and, and some of the games like in L.A., um, you know, because I have family in both, uh, you know, the northern and southern part of California, right? Um, as well as I had some fans, uh, I mean, some family in Portland and you know Houston also and Louisiana, uh, where my dad's side is at. Uh, so the uh, you know New Orleans team was down there, and I wish those teams were still there because it gives uh you know it gives you opportunity to see your fans. And being that I was in in San Jose, um, you know my my mom could come see me more often. Um, you know my family members up there in Northern California, where you know in uh, Palo Alto and Richmond and uh, Oakland and you know all that area up there. I mean. I loved it. It was, you know, the, the weather's nice. It's cooler, you know. Yeah. I can shoot. I can wear a sweater. You know, I can okay. wear a jacket. You know, but you know, those are things that you wish that you probably could have uh, controlled more in your beginning years. But you know, rookie years, you're out there. You're trying to make a name for yourself. You're just going out there and compete. Yeah, it's almost like you're a different. You have a different mentality. You know, when you're like, say, a rookie or first couple of years. As opposed to you know second time around, third time around, end of your yeah. uh, kind of stay, I could just imagine yeah. you know how your perspective changes. You yeah, observe differently. It, def- it definitely changes. I mean, you know, you're trying to go out there and make a name for yourself. To you know, hey, I want to get paid. Don't don't get me wrong. Everybody okay. plays this game, uh, you know, for the love of it, but they also definitely want to get you know compensated. To I hey, I want a championship. I want to you know or or whatever you have it records. Uh, you know, I always you know my philosophy my philosophy was always if you play hard if you you know if you did everything that you did possible in practice and made it easier for your you made it easier for yourself come come game time and um, you know if I had good practices or great practices uh, uh, you know leading up to the game then I, you know everything else is just going to be easy. Yeah, okay. Um thinking about getting ready for the game time and now we gotta let's switch over, you know, to I know you're you're not in the in the vault there, you work with the city of Phoenix and area. But how's your yeah. um how's the things going around with um getting ready for the um, the Reno Bowl that's going up next week? Well, you know, there are a lot of there are a lot of different uh there, there's a lot of talk on as to how they're gonna approach it and how many fans are gonna be there. You know, we had one of the biggest the biggest crowds, if not the biggest crowds, uh, here in Arizona in, in, in 1997, which had 17,000 uh, fans there, you know, packing, packing at the time it was called America West Arena. Yeah. Yes. So, um, you know, I, I don't know if anybody's come close to that or, you know, top that, but um, they're going to try uh, and give their best effort uh, for the stadium here in Glendale and, see if they can get as many fans as, cause they, because they have pride. Our fans have pride, and they want to show that they can do better uh, than anybody else. And you got to love that. you got to love that type of, uh, of, of fans and community and atmosphere like that because they're talking about tailgating and, you know, traditional tailgating, that, you know, where you go outside or, or go yeah. into a yeah. – Yeah, you don't, you don't normally see that in the Arena Football League. You don't see that, and that would you know that's that's just another facet or an addition to arena football that they can introduce, and you know, this, you know, fans and friends from all over can come and enjoy themselves. I mean, you, you don't get that chance to do that, but it would be nice, you know, it would be nice to do that. Yeah. So before we let you go, we we have to get um, your um, favorite um, things about picking who's going to win, and then what what do you think what the win's going to be about? 
Bye. Oh, you know what? I've always said this. I mean, when it comes to championship games, and I learned this from Danny. I've learned this from Markham, the late Markham. Yeah. Uh, I've learned this from Coach Miley. Uh, those three coaches were some of the best offensive coaches and arena-minded coaches uh, and overall coaches, period, because of their philosophy. And in arena football, when it comes down to two teams that are matched or evenly matched, it comes down to one thing, who has the ball last. That's what it basically comes down to and how smart you play it. Because um, I want to say 96, we played Markham at their arena. And we had the ball last, and we had we had one of those plays where Danny called a, a he called a specific play. I'm, I, I don't know if we didn't communicate it right, uh, but we end up losing that game by one point. Wow! Yeah. And we beat the ball, and Tampa went on to uh, to win it. Contrary to that, we came back in '97, Tampa. At our home, we had the last. And, you know, we were in that same situation, and we won it. Even though Cedric got hurt, we won it, uh, you know, having the ball last and keeping possession. And, you know, those, those are situations that you learn. And I just I just see right now that Arizona is 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 a powerhouse. That doesn't, that doesn't mean that you know, Jacksonville cannot win. I'm not saying that. It's just that they're they're up against a lot. And Kevin Guy is going to have his, you know, he's going to have them ready. Now, this game is going to come down to whether Arizona, I mean, Jacksonville can stop Arizona on the offense. Actually, um, actually the, um, the, we're playing the Philadelphia Soul. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Sorry. Philadelphia yeah. Soul. Yeah. <laughs> Whether the soul no, can no problem. Stop, <laughs> can the soul stop their offense? Yeah. If they can stop their offense, then this game becomes much easier for them. Yeah. Haven't seen a lot of stoppage. Uh, you haven't seen a lot of stoppage um, in these last games, last playoffs. You've seen people going on the fourth down, forcing them to kick the field goal. That's big, but you haven't seen that a lot. So, so you know, all, all of the success of being great. There is, you know, the whole argument about if you do something that if you put a team that's so dominant like Arizona into a position Mm -hmm. that they're not used to having a position like that. If, you know, if you're so good and everything, you know, compared to other teams and everything, sometimes it doesn't give you that practice you need in order to be able to be prepared for each and every situation. So it's just a key for Philadelphia if they're going to be successful is to do something that... Arizona hasn't already seen and kind of throw them off and get the momentum, right? Well, I think, yeah, and I think that's a part of it. I mean, I, you don't throw the same game plan out there. You do you do the things that, that are, you know, that work for you throughout the year. I think that you do that. But I think you also throw wrinkles in there. I think you give them different formations. I think that you, uh, you know, give them, uh, uh, you know, a different look at times. I mean, you can run, uh, you know, you can run a number of plays that may be the same, but out of di- different fronts and different formations. And you make them think. I mean, you know, you put your players in the best positions. And at, uh, the biggest thing is execution. You can't have drop balls and ball stones into the stands. You know, that that's not going to work. Missed opportunities. You know, fast. The tempo is already fast. And you start to lose your momentum and you start to get behind. Man, it's can go downhill fast. Yeah, especially with the, the arena bow action. You know, that's how, how things can really go. Like yeah. last, it was witnessed last year in the second half, there was a switch between the Sabercats and the and the Sharks last year. It just went went downhill. A couple of lucky bounces, and boom. The momentum. Switched. Once you switch momentum, it's hard to get that yeah. back. So it's hard. Yep, and we look we look forward to seeing it out there. We're gonna be, I'm gonna be flying out there on Thursday next week. And I think Tom's coming in on Friday morning, the day of the game. So. We hope to run into you uh, there at, at Gila River Arena. So we hope to see you out there. Well, hey, you know what? I hope to see you guys there. If I, you know, I do have a, 
a planned trip to uh, L.A. Uh, that that you know that's you know that I'm thinking about because it's uh, it's um, a high school it's a high school game. One of one of the former players, Tracy Mal's son, is playing on uh, Mountain uh, uh, Mountain Point, which is going out there to California to play. And you know they're top ranked here in Arizona, and they're playing a top ranked team in California. So oh wow. Uh, it's going to it's going to be an interesting week, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. You know, I I uh, talking about you know like the old you, you're you're part of uh, the first you know go out uh, you know when the Arena Football League was at its height, and you mm-hmm. know today is kind of a different game. You don't have the uh, uh, you know the the same you know sponsorships and commitment. Um, if right. you could kind of. And I know this is not really a set formula or or the the best answer, but if you could kind of give your advice, if somebody's asking, you know, who's responsible for the new league, what what it can take to kind of get us back to, you know, so many more cities and so much a bigger league. You experiencing it from you know from from the old you know older league. Uh, what what would you be your uh, your advice to the new league? How to get you to where? You know, to the level to where it used to be. Wow, that's a good question. That's 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 a real good question because a lot of people have asked me that, and and you know, really, I you know, I really think that you have to open up to the fans. Uh, I, I mean, I think that you have to give the fans a voice, a, a more more of a voice uh, at what you're doing. Not saying that you don't, you know, you have your rules and regulations and the structure of the arena football. But arena football is unique in that sense, in that the fans are committed. Uh, they're on top of things. Um, you know, you got to be, uh, you got to get back to that atmosphere where fans were more involved and fans were coming out. Uh, and, and you know, um, like Baker said, I mean, our fans, you know, our fans were one of the, you know, the staples, the staples of arena football. Our relationship is unique in that sense, and you got to get back to doing that. You know, it's, arena football it's its own product. You know, it sells its own self. The action, um, the scoring. Um, you know, um, you know, a shorter time of period being out there uh, as far as uh, TV TV wise. I mean, and and you know. I just think that sometimes we've gotten away from that. And some of the teams, um, I think a little bit more so the parity of it. I mean, if you're if you have teams that are dominating the league, I'm not saying that you can't. You know, that doesn't help you or help the. I mean, I don't think that that helps the league. Let me say this: that doesn't help the league. The fact that you know you have teams that are one team that's dominating the whole team. I think that the parity needs to be. Uh, a little bit better, and I think that you know the you know the cities and where you play. I think that you know the Isles, the Iowas we miss, the San Jose's we miss, the New Orleans we you know teams we miss. Uh, you know, even some of the teams up up north, you know, Minnesota and back east. I mean, you you know, you know that you're going to get a game when you you know Nashville, and the Cats. I mean, some of those people who played. I mean, good coaching. And I think a part of that is some of the former players who have played, given them an opportunity to play, they know the game just as well as any other person. I'm, I myself know, you know, arena football. I'm not saying I'm the master at it. I'm not saying that I'm, you know, the greatest. But I've played under three different coaches that are all considered to be the greatest at what they do. Danny, Markham, Miley. I know offense. I definitely know that. I know how to score. I've been an offensive uh, 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 juggernaut on the field. So I think some of the players need to be given the opportunity as well as putting them out there in the community, giving them a chance to, you know, be the ambassadors for arena football and expanding, um, expanding, you know, that commitment and that communication. So kind of exposing them to the arena f- football because there's a lot yes. of people out there that have never even experienced that and, and uh, kind of add to what you're saying is that also find the niche. You know, the niche is you could bring the whole family for under 100 bucks. 
You're gonna mm-hmm. get. You're gonna rule. You're gonna get that personal attention. They're not gonna be these gladiators that are larger than life that are way out in this big, huge field. So it's like find out what is the soul, the heart and soul of the arena football that made it so um, successful in the first go around and bring everyone up to speed because there's a new generation out there. All these new kids that are coming out. They weren't even born when, you know. There, there, is a, there is a new generation. And I think one of the big, I mean, one, one of the things, and I know a lot of people don't like to touch on this, is the salary structure. You right. know, there, were, there was a time when people were paid. I mean, you got to, you know, I'm not, and I'm not arguing against your, your payment structure, but a quarterback making X amount of dollars and your lineman making X amount of dollars and it being a big, yeah. uh, you know, a big gap, that's going to kill, that's going to kill any league. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying one person is, you know, the quarterback is not important or this receiver is not important, but come on. If you're going to, if you're going to do that, you're going to have some, you're going to have some, you know, you're going to have some, some, some gaps and you're going to have some not so good moments. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, we would like to sum this up a little bit, you know, so we'll let you go. Cause on here, you're, you're driving there in the hundred degree t- temperature. We yeah. want thank you for taking your time okay. out. And, and hey, be- you, see me, you see me, I'm sweating, man. I'm sweating. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's why we're going to let you go, man. Let you get hey. back into okay. the air conditioning. Wow. Yeah. So we want to thank you, Calvin, for um, being on our show this this weekend. We, maybe we'll hopefully we'll do run into you next week at the Reno Bowl Festival. So thanks. Thank you much, man. Yeah, appreciate it. All right, man. We'll thank let you go and, and go get some water and cool off, man. All right. All right, man. You have a good one. All right. Okay, you too. You too. Thank, bye. All right. Bye. We want to thank Calvin Schexnader for joining us on our show. And now we're going to preview the Arena Bowl. Yeah, that's right. Next week is the big game, the last game of the AFL season for 2016. What a shame. It was a great season. Great. Quick. Fast-paced. Yep. Everything you want. And on tap next week, of course, Arena Bowl 29 is actually going to be taking place in Glendale, Arizona at the Gila River Arena in Glendale instead of at Talking Stick this year. Hey, you know what? It'll be a nice little uh, getaway and it'll be a nice little change from uh, downtown Phoenix and uh, it'll give us an opportunity to kind of you know, preview the uh, new arena there. Yep. So, uh, great. And just to let some fans that are coming in from out of town, whether you're the Philadelphia's Nine Man or any other fans around the country, and you're coming into town, that area, um, that area where the, the Gila River Arena is, it's really, ni- it's a really nice, clean area. It um, has a lot of restaurants and venues there you could go in and have a nice meal and, and lay back and family oriented. It's right next to um, the University of Phoenix Stadium where the NFL's Arizona Cardinal play which I have attended many times, and I've been to that shopping complex and that restaurant just to go to hang out with, you know, whether there's a sporting event on or not. It's a nice place, a lot of restaurants. Uh, one of my favorite restaurants there was Margaritaville. Ooh, Margaritaville. So, you know, Sounds good. we got some good stuff going on. So, But let's go back to why we're here. We're actually, um, the entertainment's fine and all dandy, but let's go and talk about the big game of the week next week, and that's Arizona hosting Philadelphia once again this year. Well, you know, the good thing about it is you're having the two best records in a league against each other. So it was kind of one of those inevitable situations. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was we had some other good teams that were in the playoffs, but now when it comes down to it, it kind of all worked itself out. So let's go ahead and start with um, a, l- a little quick review of last week's American Conference game with um, Philadelphia and Jacksonville at Allentown and PPL Center. Um, my take from last week is that it almost looked like la- neither team really had a set mind to really win that game. Well, it was kind of interesting how uh, Highland, you know, made that interception early in the game and ran back for a touchdown. Yeah. So you kind of had a feel for, okay, this is where the momentum's starting. But then again, at that point, it was really kind of a back and forth struggle. Anybody's yeah. game. Yeah, nobody wanted to show that they really, really wanted to dominate one another and, and go to the arena bowl it, it just appeared it was just there was a lot of mental errors a lot of mistakes um as far as for turnovers and inconsistent pass and turnover on downs and with the arena bowl you can't have that 
No. So you, you know, got to play your best game. You got to bring the, your best football. From what oh, the record wise, from uh, the Philadelphia Soul standpoint, is like they didn't play up to their record, you know, posted record caliber that they played during the regular season. And for from a Jacksonville standpoint, they played about what they played for, you know, record wise um, in the conference championship game. Maybe a little bit better, but like I said. The game from that standpoint, you wouldn't determine that both teams were really to be championship caliber teams yet. That's right. Now, if we flip the script and come back onto the West Coast and uh, last week's game, um, Arizona and Cleveland, that was a whole different picture. I mean, yeah. I mean, unfortunately, uh, from really like most of the game, you knew which way it was going. And, of course, it didn't help the opposing team having such 15,000 plus like fifteen thousand one hundred. I mean, that is that the is snake pit. yeah. That's back into the you know old AFL type numbers on a consistency. So uh, you know, way to go for the uh, Arizona crowd getting involved. Maybe anybody that came over, you know, from uh, you know from another city, um, you know, they really packed that. So yeah, that's intimidating. Yeah, it is. Arizona Scythe Man can be fierce in that arena, and they, it improved so this whole season. And Arizona basically did a clean sweep, you know, being undefeated at the Snake Pit. But now the snake pit moves moves roughly around what, 15 to 20 minutes north on the 101 loop to Glendale. And they play at the Gila River Arena in Glendale there, which is a nice arena. Um, it's um, Their main homes are the Arizona Coyotes of the National Hockey League. And they um, it's a bigger, nice arena than Talking Stick. Um, they could probably fit close to around 17,200 for arena football configuration. One of my main things is that well, two things. One, they don't have that that hard decking at like they um, at the um, Gila or Gila, um, like they do in Talking Stick uh, with um, the casino sponsorship there. That's all the uh, that they call the balls dead. A lot of times when it gets off the net. So that's actually regular seats. It's going to be regular configuration. It's going to yeah. be like a regular arena. It's not going to be small. Is that is that hockey um, worthy type of arena? By the way, Gila. Yeah, they have the Arizona Kai ladies play there. Is it okay? You know, so in the NHL. So in this case, then. You know, my, I you know my question also is how the fans are set up as far as if they're like right up at the wall, or if they're above the wall, or if they're set back. I mean, if it if it's a it's if it's a regular configuration and normal. I think with this one, um, the teams from from the first part, the teams will have their own little sidelines. They'll be on the field. They'll be in the hockey benches. I mean, before they used to before they placed the teams in the corners at Talking Stick, they um, the Rattlers and the Visiting team would be in the hockey benches at Talking Stick. Or back then it was American West and U.S. Airways Arena because the Coyotes, when they moved down here and were a uh, relocated team, they did play a talking stick. But just the configuration of that arena is a little bit too small to be a true NHL caliber arena. Um, so with um, the standpoint, it's like from us here in San Jose, it'd be like going to the SAP Center. So you know what's good about that, and and you know we've had an opportunity to be on the road uh, for some games to where you know you do have the opposing both teams on you know, different corners, right? And I think it really plays a big part for the conditioning of the linemen, both offense and defense, because they have to run from one side of the field to the next when they're making, uh, uh, you know, when they're exchanging players, exchanging personnel, and, and uh, putting different packages in, right? Yeah, it's a time so, consideration. Yeah, so, and also, you know, I think more from, like, a strategy, a player, I mean, you really want to have both teams, ideally, in the center of the field, that way, they can kind of see the best of all worlds. Whereas if they're uh, kind of isolated to the corner, I could just see from a coaching perspective. And I know, you know, you got your offensive coordinators and defense, you know, every, every, uh, the coaches kind of going up and down the field and everything. But um, I particularly think, um, you know, it would, it would be advantageous to have it kind of set up as it is in the SAP Center that is, as it's going to be in Glendale. Yeah, so it's going to be a nice arena either way, and I'm sure most of the it's going to be loud. I'm already hearing reports from um, some friends of mine in Phoenix that um, they're expecting around at least 17,000 there. They want to fill up that arena and make it as close to a home game as possible, you know, even though it's just 20 minutes north. And it's not as big of a track as it was uh, last year's arena as far as the home team going what, an hour away? Like an hour 10, hour 20. Yeah, minutes, yeah, so the good thing about that for Arizona fans and even and even for Philadelphia fans is that probably a lo- the majority of the people are that are traveling from out of town are probably going to be set up shop in uh, Phoenix. So this is just a hop, skip, and a jump uh, right over to Glendale. 
Yeah. So uh, with that said, once everybody gets settled in and all the fans are settled in, the X actual comes to day, uh, game time. Now Philadelphia um, is coming into this game as obviously the underdog, not only one that because they're the visiting team, uh, but just the way that things have transpired over the year and the way that ended up with the how they played last week. Um, it, it seems like they're going to be the underdog in the way that Arizona dominated over Cleveland so much. That's how you would think that, you know, Cleve, um, Arizona will be the gone on favorites to win the Reno Bowl this year. Yeah, I mean, probably from a home perspective standpoint, uh, that's, you know, that's definitely an advantage. Uh, I, you know, I particularly, and I think it's good for the sport, and I think it's good for players in, in, in general just on both sides is, yeah, I mean, it is fun to have a dominating, you know, uh, butt-kicking type of situation but uh for the fans for just the whole experience you know the the whole what sells tickets is the unknown and the suspense and the action so if we could have a more level um so you know any of the players uh listening out there any of the coaching staff if you could you know if you guys could kind of get together and make sure that uh <laughs> <laughs> Knowing the coaching staff between Philadelphia and Arizona, uh, I, 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 I could tell. Yeah, I, I, I probably figured uh, that uh, they're not on speaking terms. Yeah, uh, anytime they're soon. not going to relay any secrets, you know, going on. You know, <laughs> they've already played each other twice this year, and you know, Arizona lost in Philadelphia. Philadelphia lost in Arizona. So, you know, if that um, happens to, again, if the pattern keeps up right there, then you know it's Philadelphia that's going to lose to Arizona in the Arena Bowl. Yeah. So, but. This is the Arena Bowl. Anything can happen. Um, this is what you play for. This is why you go to training camp. This is why you start the season. This is why you get up, you bust your butt, and you make it happen. It's for the Arena Bowl. If you're not going to win the Arena Bowl, then you know what? It's like that's the main priority. No okay. holds bar. Okay, with that said, yeah. who do you got? And by how many points? Oh, I'm gonna add that little squeaker in there. Okay. Um, so who do you got, Arizona or Philadelphia winning? I I'm gonna take uh, Arizona by five. Five points. Yeah. Wow, that's an odd number. Yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> well, it happened last week, so I didn't think it was gonna be an odd number for this past uh, game, the Philadelphia um, Sharks. Yeah. Philadelphia Sharks. I mean, Phil- Philadelphia. <laughs> so, Philadelphia. You're, no, you're, no, I was I was saying both teams. Philadelphia and oh, oh, Florida, okay. uh, um, Jacksonville. The Philadelphia Sharks game, okay. Yeah, the Philadelphia and Sharks game. Okay. It's just so much easier to say Philadelphia, and it's so much easier when you think of Sharks. Philly, Jacksonville. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. So um, so he's saying Arizona by five. I'm going to say Arizona, but I'm going to say Arizona probably. My gut says ten, but I I got to stick with five. I got friends on both teams, too, so I hope they don't contact me after this game. <laughs> uh, I'm going to say Arizona, and I'm going to say Arizona's going to win by 21. Holy mackerel. But uh, get this. I want to say that it's going to be a close game throughout the first half. Everybody, will, of course, the first quarter will be like the, what could be considered the nerves mm-hmm. quarter because, you know, it's a, di- it's a different stage than just a standard old game. Um, for rankings or whatever you have for, you know, for the seating for the playoffs like they did before. But now with it's in front of the cameras and you're on ESPN 1, not the, you know. Yeah. So also from a TV standpoint, we want this to be a close game. So that way people who cannot, you know, come to the games or don't have the teams in their local area that they see the game on, on national TV, that we make this an exciting game and, and make them more more interesting than a, a complete blowout. So, so if it's a, if it's by twenty one, are you still sticking to that? By the way, yes, I'm sticking okay. to that. Arizona by twenty one. So what that means is it's not going to be decided with the last possession of the of the game. No. Okay. For Somewhere me, between be, the transition yeah. third and fourth quarter around that area, I mean, like the first drive of the fourth quarter, may be the point to seal it up. So, you, do you think uh, things are going to be significantly different between the first half? And the second yes. half of the game, yes, definitely. So there's going to be coaching adjustments and changes and game turnovers plans. too. Turnovers. Okay. I'm I'm having a feeling the um, the turnover bug that struck Rodabaugh last year or last week, you know, is going to happen again this week. Yeah, or next week, you know, for the Arena Bowl. So I think that's what's going to happen. I think it's going to be turnovers. But if Rodabaugh uh, throws more consistent and connects with his receiver like Darius Money Reynolds, you know. Um, who knows what could happen? You know, they, they, they prove me wrong. 
Yeah, and I, I think we also had this conversation uh, with uh, Calvin Schexnader, um during the last show. But uh, we were talking about how sometimes with a uh, organization, a team, they're dominating so much that maybe they don't get a whole lot of different looks that that actually knocks them off their socks and rocks them back. So in order for Philadelphia to to win this game successfully, because you know Kevin Guy is going to have the team ready and prepared, you know the team, they've been in this situation many a time, so they're going to be prepared. Um, so it's just going to be... It's going to be a matter of putting up a unique game plan that throws Arizona off and they can take advantage of that, uh, Philadelphia, as well as keep the momentum going. If they don't get that, then it's going to be dominated by you know a home crowd. You know everyone's going to be loud. So not only are the players going to be putting their A game, the fans are going to be putting their A game as well. So... It's going to be one of those situations that, you know, maybe if they could uh, knock them off to where they have them do something that they don't normally see and normally do and not not have an opportunity to respond all season to this particular game plan. So that's kind of my key is really just unpreparedness uh, for the lack of or the success that Arizona's had. Maybe not knowing how it feels to be beaten in a particular yeah. way. I can see Guy telling his players, say, don't expect this win to come to you. Go right. out and battle and, and like it's the first game of the season. Right. You know, just because we had such a dominating season this year, it doesn't mean that this game is going to come. And now from Philadelphia and Clint Dozell, they lost to Arizona last time. I mean, the only uh, Arena Bowl victory that um, Philadelphia has is over the San Jose Sabercats back in 2008. Right. So... They've lost to Arizona in the Arena Bowl. I think they played down at the Amway Center when it was still a neutral site game when they were coming back from the the, the 2009 downfall. But um, so I'm thinking Philadelphia is going to be extremely hungry. And now, if you are truly a hung, hungry team in the soul, the play that you had last week against the Sharks is not going to be enough, not nearly enough. And you cannot, yeah. you know, you got to create turnovers and you got to make Nick Davila. Throw those interceptions. You got to stop that Arizona offensive attack, and then if you go to the, then you might have a chance in this game. See, the thing is, the advantage that Arizona has, especially their quarterback, you know, and their coaching staff, is that they're patient and they know that if things aren't going right, they have a very short memory. They throw an interception, they do, they make a mistake, very short memory. So they have the advantage, and that's the advantage often what these teams have. Uh, be into the big game, being in all the big playoffs and everything, is they know how to prepare themselves because you're going to make a mistake, you're going to lose. Managing their emotions. Yes, that's, that's exactly. exactly. They've exactly. been there so often, like they said, they're going for their sixth arena bowl. They've been there so often that they know how to, to uh, prepare for the big game, and it's all about emotional management. Yes. And a lot of the players that are on their ro- ro- roster for the Rattlers are from the Sabercats who were in the big game last year and won. And there's a couple of players on the solo side, I believe, at least two that I know of right off the top of my head, that are also from the Sabercats last year. So they were in the big game. So the guys that were not there, they can lean on to these guys from the Sabercats last year that are now on their rosters and you know, and try to get this marriage and try to pre- promote, uh, prepare emotionally. But even though when it comes down to it and when it's lights, camera, action, and you're doing all the you know, pomp and circumstance of introducing, introducing the team, uh, to get ready for the game day, uh, it's it's a different thing. Something clicks in your head and it just rouses you. Get adrenaline. So so how about Philadelphia? Um, do you think they're going to do any trick plays? Anything to kind of you know rattle the rattlers unexpectedly? Because... I think Philadelphia might r- go to the run game. Okay. You know, I think they might return to the run game a little bit more. Um, they might do not as many deep passes, but they might do a little more out out screens, you know. So kind of more play, more plays, but consistently scoring. Yeah, they'll try to do that. They're not going to try to rush the the ball down. They're going to try to control the line of scrimmage and try to control the possession and elongate their um, the possession, the drives. Until yeah, but then, but then, but then, and then also, you know, to add to what you're saying is, if it turns out that the Villa is, you know, if if they're opening up the game, right? And that's their game plan is to strike fast, strike swift, strike quick. Strike as one. Sounds like a commercial. 
Well, that's what Arizona goes by. This yeah, I know. Start this <laughs> that's one, it. you know. <laughs> that's, that's, that that's good. You know, Arizona's that's nice. Man, you know what? Like that's that. something I would say. Um, we could talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so so the thing is, if that happens and the the points start t- tallying up on Arizona side, then pretty soon you can't go to those little plays right to get yeah. things done. Pretty soon you have to start de- getting desperate. And almost changing your game plan, and you never want to change your game plan. That's really, if you're changing your game plan, it's not working, and you're kind of in desperation mode. So it'll be interesting to see. Um, I know, you know, I can speak for both of us. It's going to be a exciting game. Uh, you know, anything's possible. It's going to be uh, nice to see that level of energy that was there last week. If there's that big of a crowd, um, if even bigger than last week, then uh, we're going to kind of fill it. We're going to fill the stands. We're going to feel the energy, and we're probably going to get a headache. And I guess that's the whole idea, right? Yeah. If we get a headache, then uh, the fans are loud enough to where the and we'll players be are the, being disrupted. We'll be on the field level, so covering the game. So Yes, so that'll be interesting. And just letting you know that um, the reason it was a 2014 Arena Bowl, which was at the Q in Cleveland, they had 17,100-plus at that arena Wow. for the Arena Bowl. But that's not the biggest. I think the biggest they've ever had, I think I want to say it's around thirty to forty thousand for an arena ball game. What? And they had that at the Sunkiss Dome in Tampa, Florida, or at St. Petersburg, which is now called Tropicana Fields, where the Tampa Bay Rays played their baseball game. Ah, uh, okay. Because the Tampa Bay Storm did play there and they converted in, so they had roughly around thirty to forty thousand there before they built the the Mall Arena because they didn't have a hockey team. So wow. they didn't have like or the St. Titus Forum to the Mall Arena. They didn't have a full fledged arena there in Tampa until the the hockey team came there. Yeah, so, so that, that must have been something. That was the biggest arena bowl attendance ever, and that's I mean trying to look it up on my phone here, but that's just going. So it kind of so the thing is, it kind of like makes you wonder is if these other arenas, if they were higher capacity, if they would have had just as many in certain situations. It could be. It could be. So we hope everything turns out great. So. That's why we got our picks. So, Tom, just to sum things up, Tom is picking Arizona to win by a nickel, and I'm picking Arizona to win by... A freaking uh, quarter. No, no, almost a quarter. <laughs> almost a quarter. You know, um, so 21. So that's why we have it, and that's going to be our episode for this week. Once again, we'd like to thank Calvin Schechtsnader for uh, being on our, our show this week. Very, very much appreciate it, man. Uh, great and great we, show. We look to bring um, some great interviews um, and questions, you know, from fans and some of the, the arena ball players um, next week at the Arena Bowl. Until then, we hope to see you at the Arena. See you then.